had tons of um, data and we didn't know where to put those data. So, and eventually we cooked something like database. It was horrible, it was awful, but it allow, allowed us to analyze what we got from the, our in expedition uh, materials. So that was my first introduction with data. It was 1991. So JSON, it is JavaScript object notation. If you are not familiar, it is interchangeable data format. It was uh, uh, probably developed in 2010 or something about uh, that time and essentially solving one problem, uh, communication between client and server, where client doesn't need to be complicated engine and the format should be understandable and easily parse parsable. It is collection of key value pairs and when we say the value, value can be another JSON, can be a, an array or array of JSON files. So, and it can nest by different levels. So you have one key, then value is another JSON, then you have another key inside the JSON. So like a Russian doll. So, and sometimes in my experience, that nesting can be quite intensive. Like you, you have like 20, 30, Level, level levels of nesting in different uh, cases. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time here why we use JSON, because it is flexible, because developers like it, it is widely adopted for logging, it is used in microservices, in uh, remote procedure calls, in REST API, and it is suitable for loosely defined points. There are tons of reasons to use JSON. There are some reasons not to use JSON, but I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> it is highly opinionated discussion, probably. So, in, I believe JSON was uh, introduced as a first-class citizen in Postgres, probably in 2012. If I'm not correct, if I'm not right, just correct me. Uh, and it was kind of first implementation. I don't remember who said that on that time, that Postgres cheated implementing the JSON because the JSON was implemented like text format. It was not binary implementation first. But later it was properly implemented as JSONB and JSONB is a binary implementation of JSON. And what is the difference? As I said, JSON itself, it is a blob of text with keeping the all original um, formatting and keys and everything else as it was inserted. The JSONB, it is a binary tree with a header with G entry and context stored, stored like separately and you have a, like a tree, search tree inside each JSONB file. So since it is, uh, pa since it is, it has to build that structure, it is parsed every time when you insert the data. So from that fundamental difference uh, between two different formats comes some uh, additional consequences. So the data storage, again, I said that JSON preserve original format JSONB transform to binary. When JSONB transforms to binary, it eliminates duplicated keys and store only the last value for duplicated keys, when the JSON will store duplicated keys as they were inserted first. The operation with keys, the JSON itself as a format, it is a text value. If you want to update it, you just replace it. When the JSON B can be updated, you can add delete key, update key, and the same applies to nested uh, keys as well. And performance-wise, JSON really good when you insert the data because you don't need to parse it. But it is not so great when you want to query the data because when you want to search for key value, you need to parse the j every JSON, uh, JSON value and get the keys and uh, do, doing all the, all, all the work. So when you work with JSON B, you pay when you insert the data, but you get benefits when you extract the data. Also, 
JSON B supports gene index, which can improve your search. In some cases, really uh, with great benefit. Some cases is not. It depends. Again, how the, the tree, gene tree is built and what kind of data you have inside. But still, it is uh, one of the benefits you can consider as a one potential when you choose between how you store your data, JSON or JSONB. The simple uh, example is I created a table with um, like two columns, one ID, another is JSON. And when I created a table, I put a JSON just to show the difference between how, you, how it is different when it is inserted. And then I put two rows. One is cast as JSON. The same data are cast as JSONB. And you can see the difference. The first, you see the first uh, row has deprecated keys, and it is exactly as it was in original insert. But the second, the keys were sorted first, then the active key has only last value, active equal true. So it is different in many ways. So it is just simple example how they different when you insert the data and what kind of output you may have when you get a JSON versus JSON B. So what to choose? That's probably a question for a million dollars. <laughs> because if you know in advance what you want to do with data, you probably might have better decision. Because JSONB is preferable in most cases when you want to update the data, when you want to index the data without knowing in advance what kind of path for access you want to have, and when you care about extract performance. But there are some cases when JSON can be much more preferable. For example, when you have to keep original keys order, and sometimes it is important, and it is important for, for example, if you store log access and all the information related to activity of your application for some government uh, or uh, regulations uh, where they want to see exactly how it was inserted. When you need to duplicate it keys, some, I, I know some cases where you want to have that all the values for duplicated keys. When insert speed is extremely important for you, when maybe extract is not so important as insert to be able to insert so much data. And when you need original format by some other reasons, and yesterday I believe Chris uh, talking about the null values, mentioned one case when you potentially can have uh, somehow null values in JSON, but if you try to insert the same data to JSON B, it will convert to empty string instead of null. So that's potential case. So there are what to choose. Good question. The first question would be what are you going to do with data inside the table? So, simple example, how much you pay for JSON-B parsing. It is just arbitrary table uh, with about 26 million rows, and then I insert those data to two different tables. So, first case, it is JSON, and you can see that I spent about 185 seconds to insert all those rows. For JSON-B, I spent more than two times more. And if I create an index on top of the JSON, this B3 index with some simple path, very small one, the insert speed reduced by two times. And, but when you create the same index on JSON B, you can see the difference is not so big because when you parse the data, you use the same data to insert to the index. So that's good. For select from the JSON, you have 67 seconds. For JSON B, you have only four seconds. It is 16 times performance benefit, right? Uh, if, if you work with indexes, it is 
a little bit less different because what is different is only extracting path when you get the values already filtered by index. So for another select, I just add one more condition to select. It is even more di difference when you talk without indexes, JSON B versus JSON. So you have, you can see that extract is much faster for JSON B, even without any indexes. And with indexes, that difference uh, still exists. Yeah, question? I'm good question. Uh, the question was, can we index JSON, uh, not JSON B? So we are going to talk about that in details uh, later. But yes, you have, you can have create some indexes. Is the same as the yes, it is the same table, same conditions. That, that just so JSON B is slightly bigger when you insert the data. Yes. So the size for the JSON, because you have header, you have additional metadata on, on top of JSON when you parse it. But it is not always the case. <laughs> yes, but if you don't have extra spaces, like in that case, if you don't have extra spaces and if you don't have duplicated keys, you don't don't save too much uh, information, right? You don't have too much space. So, uh, yes, potentially JSON B can be less, but if you don't have extra spaces, duplicated keys, or anything else, it would take a little bit more time. Space, sorry. Yeah. yeah. All right. A uh, couple of words how we work with JSON. Let's step back and think how we work with data in the database. So we first planner will build execution path, then you extract the data from the pages in buffer cache, would put it to the data in the memory, and you work with the data and it you work with data set, you join the data set, you aggregate and everything else. So that's great. And we don't talk too much how we extract for example, column number from the page, right? It is, the, oh, we have a column, we find it a uh, place where it starts, we read the data, we put it to, to the memory. That's great. What in case of JSON? We find that column, we read the column, but it is not end of the work as, for example, for text or number. Now what you have to do, you have to extract data from that column. So you have one extra operation. And how you do that depends. The, your performance will depend, how, will depend how, how you do that. So for simple data access like row, path, uh, it has the minimum overhead. So what you do, it is like pay as you go. You go through JSON, you get the value, put it datum, here you get your key, here you get your value. That's great. Uh, we are done. And it works really well because you don't do anything in advance. You do it straight away during the parsing. And it is good for small JSON with minimal nesting. When I say small JSON, I mean JSON which keeps inside your page block without toss table. That's really good because it is most efficient way how to extract the data. But if you have multiple nesting, what happens in that case? So you have, you go, you get your column, then you s start to parse your column. You find the key and you find the value. And value, another JSON. Oh, okay. I, and it is already in datum here. So you need to go and parse another level of JSON. And then you put it here. And then you go another parse and you put it here. So you, it is chain of operation which is not really efficient by the end. If you have, for example, four, six level of nesting, that is not efficient way how to do that anymore. So how you can improve it? All right. For example, JSON subscripting, it is one of the possible way. 
can do it by a little bit different way. What it does, it builds the path to value in advance and then access the JSON and get the value. So instead of going ne uh, level by level in nesting, it is going directly straight. You pay in advance, but you save time on that uh, operations. If you have one, nest, uh, one level or one level below, it will not really give you any difference with uh, previous uh, data access, but it will h help you when the nesting is more like six, seven level. On the eighth level, probably it will start to struggle as well. One fun part. So I have a question for you. So, so all right, let me. What is, what, what do you think, what is faster if you see that data equal first name bus, like a, uh, like a voucher, right? And then another one is if I put JSON build object, which one would be faster? What do you think, guys? Any guess? One, uh, one bet on the first one. For the That's right. It is second one is faster. Second one works more efficiently with the Postgres uh, kernel. Oh, that's probably beyond that presentation, guys. <laughs> that would probably... It is a great question how it is implemented, but uh, it would take uh, too much time really uh, going through and go through all the implementation. Yeah, it is just one example what you need to think when you work with data, when you talk, think about your analytics and what you do. So that is subscription. And as I said, uh, it is good for small size and moderate nesting. When you have big JSON uh, files, you probably want to go to JSON path, and when you have really deep nesting, like 10 levels, probably that will be, it is even more expensive than previous one in terms of how you build in advance the uh, access to, to your value in the key path, but it works better with big JSON files. But that, that would be dwarfed when your JSON is grown in size. We need to talk how it is stored, right? It, is, it can be in light or use toast. And toast, it is uh, the oversized attribute storage techniques. It means another table with index where you store chunks of your data. By default, if your data more than two kilobytes, uh, Postgres will try to compress the data. And if it cannot compress it to sufficient level, uh, layer, it will put that data to toast table. And why it is so important? We are talking about access. So when it happens, instead of actual column in the page, you have only pointer to toast index. And when you use index, you will use at least two IO. It is root block and branch block. It is, it is very minimum you, you can use. And if you have only one chunk to access, it is going to be another I.O. operation. So you have to use at least three I.O. operations to get the data. But if, you're, if you have more than one chunk, or if you have to access more than one branch, it, it will be even more. So, so it, in that case, your access to extract the data from JSON depends primarily from the size of the JSON. That is direct dependence. It is almost linear. Bigger size of JSON, more uh, you spend to extract the data. So that's about toast and back. Yeah, question? Uh, you can change it technically. It is uh, default how it is compiled. But technically, you can change how many uh, so the block is designed for four rolls max, right? And yeah, and it is 2K, it is, yeah. 
Let's talk about analytics, why we are talking about analytics. Uh, why you probably, the analytics goal is get some business value from the data because without it, data uh, doesn't, don't have too much value. So usually what we do, we aggregate data, filter it, and present it in some readable format to probably business owners. And what we want is work with up-to-date data, and we want to combine sometimes with operational data to get the full picture, which is quite important. And speaking about performance, we want to get it fast, but we don't want to impact our old TP transactions on operational level uh, database. So we want a lot of things. <laughs> Not always it works this way. So you probably heard the phrase, data is new oil, right? In one sense, I support that phrase. It, it was a buzzword for a long, long time, like since 2011 or something. Yes, data, data is new oil because oil is useless as a liquid. You can't do anything with the oil. If you buy a barrel of oil, what, what are you going to do with it? You cannot put it to the car. You cannot use it as lubricant. You, you, you can't do anything. It is just stinky liquid with uh, uh, not really good feeling. But if you work and extract good value, you can get gas, plastic, and everything else from the oil. So the same about the data, really. The raw data doesn't make any value for analytics. You have to work. We have to extract the value from the data. And you apply by slicing and dicing that data using Windows functions, ranking, filtering, and everything else, what you have for analytics, right? And when we talk about difference between OTP and analytics, it is Usually, it is general approach. It is high-level bird view. It is single row versus multiple row access. It is OTP DML with entire row, like you insert row or update row or doing something else, versus very small number of columns, limited number of columns for analytics when you slice and dice your data. Query execution time is mi milliseconds versus minutes and sometimes hours, sometimes days, by the way. And OTP is 1,000 similar queries hitting your database. And uh, when you talk about analytics, sometimes people thinking about query for, for a couple of hours and then run query for another couple of hours just to get the data. So there's different uh, way how to think about it. Why, why we, would you do uh, analytics in Postgres? There are some engines for uh, analytics like Redshift in AWS, BigQuery at Google, and so, so on. Uh, the first, to get that data in warehouse, you have to move the data. And data movement, especially in some organizations care about privacy and security, it is not a trivial thing. When you move data from operational database, you have to think about security, privacy, how you mask the data, how you work with data, how you limit access to the data. There are tons of things when you start to move your data. It is not like you create a pipeline on POC in the cloud for, uh, in two hours. Oh, I solved the task. No. There comes security assessors and say, so, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. <laughs> That has to stay or has to be masked or has to be removed from the data set. And you start to build serious pipelines with security and encryption. The second, uh, Postgres, it is relational database which backbone for operational data set. And you want your analytics to be as up-to-date as possible. And a SQL in Postgres is quite rich for analytical functions and I know very, very smart, smart people doing wonders with Postgres functions and analytics uh, inside database. It is really, really kind of art how you can do analytics uh, with SQL. And those people don't want really learn a new language. No, why? <laughs> if you have really good SQL language, uh, why? Sometimes, for example, BigQuery has SQL language. It is, it is not really SQL. Uh, it is special dialect of SQL, which you need to learn, and it has its own limitations, and so on. So, how are we doing? All right. 
uh, some changes with JSON. Uh, the data inconsistency, that's quite important. Uh, you can see that insert date, it is 2024, March 14, yesterday. It is kind of obvious, right? But if you have different locale on the, your server, it could insert date 03-14, uh, 2024. That is different, and your application may not be able to transform that data. And it can be even worse. It is 2024-03-12. Is it March 12, or it is the 3rd of December? <laughs> you never know, really. <laughs> Because it can be both. Uh, the data denormalization, it means you have a lot of uh, duplicated data in each row of uh, your JSON file, which increase its size. And we discuss about the size. Size is important. Toast can kill your performance. Uh, potential performance implication because of size, potential integrity uh, pro problem because you don't have integrity and constraints on top of uh, the JSON. And by the way, by default, you don't have any statistics for values inside JSON. So when planner tries to parse the JSON, it doesn't know what is inside. Some recommendations. I don't call it best practices, but it is from experience. Don't keep all in JSON file. When Apart from some cases when you want to do that and you know why you, you do that, the idea of having one column table is not the greatest one when you try to work with the data later. That's from my experience. Try to put only flexible part of the data which you want to be in JSON, in the JSON column. And keep, try to keep it small, avoid toast. The dictionary data, it is dimensions how you want to slice your data for analytics. Probably better to keep outside of JSON because that data you want to be structured and has to have, for example, traditional formats. I will show you how it can help in some cases. And again, when you put conditions how you want to filter your data, for example, or group your data, maybe try to avoid JSON parsing in that part because it can slow down your analytics query really, really significantly, I would say. We are talking about big uh, data sets when every microseconds matter. So what can help? Um, in general, of course, you can have replica, use partitioning, that's help a lot, parallel, and in some cases, depending on engine, you probably can use columnar store. In some cases, it helps a lot. In some cases, it doesn't, but it is one of the possible solutions. We will talk a little bit about columnar uh, later. So let's talk about indexes. It was a question, can we index JSON value? Yes, we can. We can use B3 index for expression type of index. When you know exactly what kind of key you want to access by that index in advance. I want to access that particular key. I know the path. I can put that path to the index and create B3 or hash index, as a matter of fact, and use it in your condition to filter the data. That works. and works really well. But it has its own limitation. The same for nested keys and everything else. So the same expression index. But if you don't know in advance how you want to slice the data, you don't, want, you don't know the path in condition, then gin index, and gin index works only with JSONB. So the expression index is quite simple. Uh, here the example, I want to check how much bottle salt, it is data, by the way, from uh, Iowa uh, about uh, alcoholic beverages. So if I want to see how, how many bottles were sold in Wayne County of Iowa, I, I can put the sales data and county key in my J, uh, index expression and create B3 index. It works really well. 
It, it goes through bitmap index scan, then heap scan to extract the data from the JSON, and then aggregate. Here we go. So execution time is 64 milliseconds for that particular qu query. And why I put it here? Because we are going to check with other type of types of indexes. So uh, I don't want to spend too much going through the uh, plan. Plan is simple here. You have bitmap index scan on index, then you parallel heap scan on the data itself to extract the value and then aggregate all the uh, sum of bottles, right? Gene index, it is nothing to do with beverage. It is general inverted index. It has different structure. It has structure with nodes, branches, and you have IDs for your values for rows inside each branch. It doesn't keep any duplicates. It uses when the pa it split the pages when it ever flows. And when you update the data, it is quite interesting. When you update the data, it creates a pending list for updates. And in, it works in combination with pending list to search your data. And then, depending on your parameters for, for your instance, it will push the updates to gene index. And that push has its own consequences. I saw when the, with highly updatable table, sometimes you have huge spike in uh, activity when your database is 100% busy working, updating the, those changes from pending list. And then it, it is back to normal. So by default, it is using JSONB ops default class. It means it supports operation for JSONB file. JSON B data type. So, and the syntax is quite simple. You just put the your JSON B column as a gene, and you put close uh, create index using gene. Then you run the query, and it is essentially behind the scenes. You see mostly the same bitmap index scan, and then uh, heap scan, uh, and uh, so on. But it is quite interesting that execution time is slow for gene index in that case. And there are some reasons for that. First, the gene index is bigger in size, much bigger in size. We will see the difference in size uh, later. In I have some summary table with results. And it is not the same. But on the same time, the previous index works only in one case for county search. It doesn't work for anything else, really. But gene index will work for all key values in you. In you. But when I say works for all key values, when planner will decide to execute the index, because it is not always the case, just keep in mind, if you create index, it doesn't mean it will be used every time. It will depend on the cost. Gene index has its own cost for the planner. And Planner will see if it makes sense to execute the index. When I say we don't have statistics for JSON columns, we don't have statistics for column, but we have statistics for index. And for example, if in that case, uh, if I put here, I have Wayne County, and if, if I put Paul County, if somebody knows what Paul County is in Iowa, it is the biggest one, right? It is the biggest county. It has uh, the, yes, it is all the, so in that case, most of sales in Iowa happens in Paul County. In that case, planner will say, oh no, I'm not going to execute index. It doesn't make sense. I will execute full segment scan instead. So what, we can do else to minimize size for gene index. We can use JSON path ops gene index, which supports only limited number of operations with JSON path, but will will be more effective because it, it will be have less size and access it has less cost uh, combined with gene index. So if we have a look, gene index execu execution time was 177 seconds. 
the same exact operation. So we put condition when create index JSON path ops here and execute exactly the same query. Execution time 64 milliseconds. It means it is comparable with uh, B3 index, but it is not limited as a B3 index by only one path. You can use different path uh, as well. So in some cases, it is probably a better solution than just gene index with all operations. It depends how you want to work with your data really. You need to know what query are you going to execute. So index and part. Nothing comes for free in this world, right? And <laughs> of course, if you have index, you have overhead. And overhead can be quite significant. It is insert, update, delete penalty, it is storage, it is vacuuming for every operations as well. If you update or delete uh, in the table, you also need to work with the index. And we were talking about pending changes for gene indexes. Sometimes it is huge spike in, uh, in the load, just coming out of blue, just because it decides, okay, it is time to apply the, from all the pending changes to the index. Uh, just simple index impact. Uh, we inserted data in nine minutes without index, create simple gene index, and insert the same data to the same table, and it takes 34 minutes. That is difference. It is index overhead. And I'm not talking about the size. It is just simple, very efficient insert. Some summary table. What? It is not really like data you can use, but it is for comparison, it is neck to neck, more or less close, the same data, the same table, different data types, different indexes. So the build time for B3 index, it is 34 seconds. Quick, but again, it is small one path for index. For gene index, it is quite different. You have 1,181 seconds to build gene index with default gen index with JSON B ops class. For JSON path, it is more than two times less. And you can see the size as well. The B3 index, it is 174 megabytes. And by the way, the table size itself, it is about 20 gigabytes table, 26 million rows. So 174 megabytes for one small uh, B3 index. But for gene, it is four gigabyte. It is comparable with table size already in the same ballpark. For gene, gene with uh, JSON B path ops, it is slightly less, but still about three gigabyte size. So it is storage overhead you need to keep in mind. And storage overhead, it is not only the storage itself, it is vacuuming operations and everything else related to that. And they run just two simple queries. And the query is relatively the same we used in the uh, pre previous examples. And access in milliseconds, average access, it is uh, like uh, I, I run it probably 20 times or so. So with B3, it is 30, 30 milliseconds. Again, it is milliseconds. It is less than one third of a um, second. With gene index, it is 178 uh, milliseconds with JSON B path ops, it is 66. Again, by the way, it is JSON B because for JSON, it is slightly different data. If you build an index on B3, and if you don't have any indexes, it is four seconds to the same exactly query. The second query, adding one more condition to the query, uh, it will extract a little bit more data. In that case, your select will be a less efficient, but it is the growing data, it is just to extract the data from JSON itself. For JSONB path ops, it is uh, 375 and then 139. Again, difference for JSONB itself will not be so much because it is different paths. When you, for JSONB without indexes, you're going through all the blocks anyway, right? It is, and depends on conditions, whether you extract data related to two conditions or one conditions, it will not be too much difference. And insert, here the insert, and probably that 
can you tell? It is 520 seconds, then 2 million 358 seconds, or 1 million seconds. And if we talk about the JSON B insert, it is not too much different from JSON B with index, right? And it, it makes sense because you parse your data and you just add the data to the index on the same time. So it is not too much difference. So uh, we are almost, we have index advisor in AlloyDB, for example, at Google. It can help with non-JSON value as of now. But what we are working, and I'm trying to push it because I like JSON data type, to make it working with JSON and make it uh, more suitable. So what you can uh, do, we can increase CPU and memory allocation, put tons of hardware, or you can try to use columnar engine. And just, I, I know I'm almost out of time, but let me steal a couple of minutes of your time and talk. So in, we have columnar engine, and that columnar engine representation of your data in memory using columnar unit. And each columnar unit has a dictionary and information about what it's stored inside a columnar unit. Also what it can do, it push down predicates, it use Bloom filter and use CIMD to access the data. The, what CIMD it is single instruction multiple data access, which can be quite effective when you work with the data in the memory. So it is like you par parallel access when you access 64 data points in the memory of one CPU tact, which is increased performance a lot. It can help with aggregation joints uh, and fast pruning for partition tables and everything else. It has, so essentially what you have, you have uh, some dictionary on top of that uh, columnar unit. You know what is exactly inside the dictionary. It works for most of the data types except JSON. <laughs> I know it is kind of, oh, it is great engine. No, it doesn't work with JSON. So for JSON data type inside is like a blob and the uh, columnar engine doesn't really know as of now what is inside the JSON. So, but it helps anyway. Uh, for, for example, if you run the same query with gene index and columnar engine, when your data in columnar store, it will work relatively the same in terms of performance, but you will not have that index overhead when you insert the data, which is, can be quite significant. And uh, when, when it helps the most, when the non-JSON and JSON column data are populated to columnar engine. It means when you have your dimensions in the data, dimensions outside of JSON and work your conditions predicate with not using JSON parsing, in that case, columnar engine can provide a really huge boost in performance. Um, for example, it is just uh, execution plan. Here the example how different. I have two queries and I have gene index and filter on JSON column which is like parsing, it is uh, something here, uh, I believe here, that uh, I am parsing on that condition. It is 95 seconds execution time when I run that query. When I remove the index and do it with uh, columnar only, I put that to the uh, columnar store, it takes about 60, 76 seconds. Not too much difference, but you don't have overhead when you insert the data which is, can be quite significant or when you update the data. But what if you put that uh, county number outside of JSON and use it uh, as a selection here? Where is it? Uh, yes, here. Yeah, and when it happens, it is 341 milliseconds. It is quite significant improvements in performance. And what I did, I, I just put one value outside of JSON for analytics, and I just run this relatively the same query. And it is why I think not that 
big one table with one column JSON is not the greatest idea. So um, we ran out of time. I think questions. What? So you 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 can use uh, uh, so l let me explain how I understood the question. So can I include the JSON path to gene index? No, don't you can I include? Can I make cover indexes, gene indexes, or JSON indexes in this? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Oh, so, so, okay. uh, here? Yeah, you can. So you 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 mean? Uh, Yes, you can do that, and it, it means uh, you, have, you, you want to have index-only scan instead. Oh, yeah, yeah. Technically, yes. Technically, you can do that. But uh, you, you remember that it, it will not be for free, right? It, it is not going to be for free. I mean, your, your overhead will be bigger. Yeah, but it depends on your data size and how much you're going to pay for that. It is rate of changes. Yes. Uh, yeah, it is one of the possibilities. Yeah. Which one? That? Yeah, but it is limited on what you can do with that option. You, can, you have only one path. You have only one predefined path for that index, nothing else. It is what, what you can do, actually, uh, how, how many operations it supports. Uh, so, JSONB path ops supports only three listed operations, nothing else. It is what, uh, how you uh, filter the data. That's the main difference. It is why it is small, why, why it is uh, faster, why it is working by this way. Uh, nothing for free in this world. You pay by one way or another, right? Tell me. In columnar, it is a good question, and I'm still uh, working with our internal team uh, because I want it, and a lot of customers want it. Yeah, because it is it creates a, a huge opportunity when you don't need to create indexes on your analytical environment and insert tons of data and on the same time get really good performance. Yes. Yeah, it is AlloyDB or AlloyDB Omni, which you can download. Yeah, yeah. The, the columnar, uh, the Engine, engine. Uh, yeah. Is it is available uh, for AlloyDB at Google Cloud or AlloyDB Omni, which you can download and use in your environment. Uh, it does. What do you mean, how? It is uh, because AlloyDB Omni is shipped with the same kernel as AlloyDB. That's top the storage layer. Not the storage layer. Storage layer uh, le level is... But columnar is in memory. Yes, columnar is memory representation of your existing data. Yes. When do they get sorted? Because sorting them is the operator. Many times you don't want. It's usually a hash table. Hash table is not sorted by default. 
uh, it is sorted during the parsing because it, it parses the data when uh, you insert it and it is sorted during the parsing. The same way, most interesting for me, it is if we go back, oh, sorry, it is. No, no, you can't. Yes. Uh, where is it? Uh, so, for me, most inter interesting that you expect the active to be here, right? Yeah, but it is mostly like here and then active because only you have duplicated values. It is why it is I I at the end. Yeah. Uh, for JSON, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> it can be even worse if you are using toss table. Right. <laughs> Good question. I don't know out of my head. Maybe somebody from... Uh, uh, how can you uh, get the size? You want to get the size before insert or after? Oh. Mm, okay, I think I think the I I can say out of my head, but yes, I, I can see the size of the col uh, columns. Yeah. Yes, uh, if you, it is how Postgres works for, with any data types, right? Yeah, it tried to compress the data if it can, and compress data will fit to that limit two kilobyte. It will it will be fine. I don't, I don't remember out of my head, sorry guys. Good question. I need to check. Yeah, yeah. No, only, only rows which cannot fit uh, to, yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, question. So it depends uh, really uh, what size of your data set because to use columnar you need to be able to put it to the memory column store, right? And it is compressed in the memory, it is uh, quite efficient, but if you have petabytes of data you want to analyze, you will not be able to put it to the memory, right? Uh, not whole table, uh, but uh, columns of the tables. Yes. Is there a for that? Permit? Yeah. This population of the column can be done by three different ways. You can put it to your Postgres com file names for the columns and tables you want to populate every time when the database starts. It is one way. The second, you can use SQL func uh, function to populate it in any time when you want. Or you can try to rely to automatic engine which will dynamically populate or e eject some 
columns, tables from the memory uh, based on your workload. It works every hour by default and analyzes your workload queries and uh, try, tries to do uh, the population automatically behind the scenes. Yeah, behind, uh, in, in the cloud, yes, it is. On top of the Colossus, you have a special engine because AlloyDB doesn't really write to data files. It no, it, it writes to wall, and wall, is, wall changes is applied to the storage system. Oh, okay. You don't have the same checkpoint uh, process in AlloyDB as you have in Postgre. You read the data from buffer cache and from the Colossus storage, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, is, it is applied behind the scene. Yeah. No, it is not Colossus. It is uh, some services on top of the Colossus, yes. The file system Colossus has... Yeah, 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 yeah. But... On the same time, you have special layer on top of Colossus exactly for AlloyDB. But yes, it is using Colossus behind the scenes. Which is included with AlloyDB Omni? Or? No, AlloyDB Omni works by traditional way, uh, just normal storage uh, uh, you work. The best, yes, for storage optimization, yes, yes. Tell me. Uh, you can write to me, really, and I, I, I will tell the product manager that we have more votes to make the changes. Yeah. I'm trying to push it forward as much as I can, uh, but it is big company. Yeah, depends for many reasons, but from g engineering resources, it is a lot of things involved. All right, any more questions, guys? I think... Hmm? Uh, I need to get blessing first. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks, it is big company and it is... But yes, uh, it is what I'm going to do. I'm going to apply for release of slides and I will try to make it public. Sometimes they do. Right. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. But no, some, sometimes for, uh, for advocates like me, uh, they, they let me to publish it externally if it is already presented. No.